on the Jacob Beer Show, I'm so happy to have on a guy um, who I don't need to say too much about because we all know his song, Sir Mix a Lot. How are you doing today? Uh, all's good, man. All's good. Getting ready for a show tomorrow, you know, chilling, getting ready to rehearse again. For sure. And is this your uh, first show this month? Oh, yeah. I, I took a break. 22, we did too much work. So 23, I said, I'm chilling. I took a vacation. And uh, yeah, so we're doing a few shows this year and that's it. Awesome. And where are you calling in from today? Um, outside of Seattle, a little place called Auburn, Washington. I've been there near the Blue Origin facility. So yeah, room enough to make noise. I love it. <laughs> For sure. Especially where you're at. Um, so kind of take us through um, you're Seattle based. You still live in Seattle. Um it's an interesting spot. I've been there. Beautiful, by the way, of course, for people who haven't visited. But take me through, you know, it's kind of different, you know, a lot of rap and stuff and R&B, of course, that culture started in New York and stuff. And you're from Seattle. So how did you kind of get started in music? I'm, I'm reading here. You started um, performing at DJing at local parties and stuff like that. But how did you kind of find out, like, this is something I want to do and I don't just want to, you know, work a nine to five job? When did you kind of decide that? Well, it actually started before hip hop started. Um, and what what happened is New Wave came out. So you had like groups like Devo, Gary Newman, Kraftwerk. And you'll notice a lot of people in hip hop, Africa Bambada mentions it, a whole bunch of people. A lot of that came from Kraftwerk. You know, the numbers beat that is also the Planet Rock beat that is also many beats by me, you know, and that influenced me initially, but I didn't know what to do with it. And then I heard hip hop and I was like, oh shit. So you mean I don't have to, yeah, I ain't got to sing. You know, <laughs> I could just, I could just, you know, so I didn't take it really serious because back then the DJ was the star. So it was Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five. You know what I mean? So the DJ was the star. So I wanted to be the DJ and that didn't work out so well. I mean, I DJ little small clubs, the Rotary Boys and Girls Club. I'd go all through the hood doing different parties and stuff, you know, and trying to, I wasn't trying to get a record deal because nobody knew what a record deal was in Seattle. We just thought they only came out of New York. So yeah, it was just, it was just about kicking it, having fun. And then it turned into something real um, the day I met Nasty Ness. Interesting. And, and take us through that a little bit, because it's really, you know, a lot of people, of course, you hear overnight success. Uh, I'm in podcasting. I still haven't gone big yet. There's no such thing as overnight success. No you, know, you started in 1980s, even though that's when it boom went off. It had taken you 12 years from start to finish when you started to get involved in it. So take us through that. Yeah, I got it. I got, I've started making songs. I got to tell you this, because it's kind of something that people didn't know about me. I started making songs not to try to do hip hop or anything like that. I just wanted to make some money selling tapes. So if your name was Dean, I'd do a rap about Dean and make a song about Dean and then sell it to him for $10, right? So that's, you know, I was about 19 you know, and trying to trying to make some money on it. And um, obviously that didn't work out too well. I was still living in the projects. And then I started doing parties at the um, the Boys and Girls Club in the central area in Seattle. And uh, I was doing it and it got kind of popular. The parties got pretty big, you know, and, and I was known for doing something different. Everybody else was just scratching, but I had, I scratched, I had, I had synthesizers, drum machines and stuff early, the early Dr. Rhythm DR55, not the DR110, the DR55. I had all that stuff early and I would, so in the middle of playing, say what was popular back then, which which would say was Planet Rock. If Planet Rock is playing, I could literally take my drum machine and I had a vocoder and I could start doing the vocoder stuff and mimicking the song. And they'd be like, this ain't the same version I used to, I'm used to listening to. So people started to buy those kind of tapes from me. And eventually uh, Ness Rodriguez, who was the, the man on the on radio, everybody wanted to get to him. You know, we all claimed to hate him, but we really needed him. And uh, he showed up one day and uh, that's where the career kind of started really I, when I think about it. Wow. Quite fascinating. And, you know, take me through, you know, of course, when you started writing what ended up being big songs um, I've listened many times, you know, to what you've said, you didn't think it was going to make it big. Um, anything I did was going to make it big. If you do it <laughs> for that reason, you'll sound like you're obviously trying to make a hit. Like you won't offend anybody. You're real safe. Now I started with a, there was a song I did that was, I didn't want to use my own voice. So I was, I changed my voice. I did the, I had a four track cassette deck. You turn it, turn the speed all the way down. 
and I rapped like I was a country dude. Like, now I'm your big mall dropper, mud duck stopper, penis <laughs> in the bottom and Adidas on the topper. It was corny, right? But they thought it was somebody else. Cause in the breaks, I'll be like, hey, mix a lot, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so I'm doing this smirk voice, this real high pitch shit. And people started to buy it. They thought it was an actual character. And they would start buying them around town. I was selling, you know, a little cassette tape for two and three dollars and stuff like that. And it started, got popular. And so Ness Ness heard it and came up and asked me about it and stuff like that. And, you know, I, I could go through the whole story, but that ended up being actually the original connection for me to get my first record deal. Wow. That is that's a, that's interesting. Of course, like you said, you started I'd say I would have paid you five bucks, you know, at the time, or well, it would have been less back then, probably five bucks is worth quite a bit today. But, you know, a little rap about myself. And then from there, you started performing in the bigger crowds and then, you know, worked your way up to getting a record deal. What was it like when Baby got back when number one, it finished a year out ahead of Elton single, Michael Jackson, Madonna, um, let's keep going on. What was that moment like? It was really interesting because I thought I was on the downside of my career because I had already had a platinum album and I had another gold album, right? Albums, not just singles, you know? So I had platinum singles and gold singles and, you know, so I'm thinking, ah, you know, and I signed with Rick Rubin, which I should have known it was going to blow up if Rick Rubin touched it. And, um, you know, I, I didn't think it was the best song on the record. I thought I did this song called One Time's Got No Case. I said, that's the best song. And Rick said, okay, go ahead and put it out. We'll see. And it flopped. It just died. It tanked. I mean, as soon as it came out, boom, fell down the steps. And um, then so I gave Rick his shot. And Rick said, I think Baby Got Back is your, is your tune. And I said, well, you know, before I let you put it out, I need to tell you what it's really about. It's not about butts, per se. And he's like, oh, he knew what it was about. He said, yeah, I know what it's about. Right? So I said, okay. So he knew. I thought everybody was going to know. Well, most 99% of the people thought the song was just about butts. But it wasn't. See, back in that era, there was a, it was known, but nobody would talk about it. There was a serious bias in Hollywood with African-American women. You'd have, you know, um, most African-American women, I'm going to be honest, um, Florida from Good Times. That was, she was a maid. Anybody that knew anything about Esther Rowe knows she was an incredible actress, you know, and she did other parts, but her first big one, she was a maid. Um, there was a spinoff person that came from one of those shows and she was a maid and she was African-American. She played in the Jeffersons. And that was the first time you saw black people with wealth on TV. But it got irritating to me. It's like every time you saw a black woman on television, she was either a maid or she was an informant for the detectives on the white detective show. So I wanted to talk about African-American women in a way that would make people maybe change a few of their opinions or mind change their mindset. So I figured I'd hide it behind something. And if you listen to the song, you'll know that song's not just about butts. Um, give me a sister. I can't resist her. Red beans and rice didn't miss it. If you watch the, if you watch the video, you'll notice the girl that's on the pedestal, the guys, which is me and my guys, me and the homies, we couldn't reach her. She was on wow. a pedestal. So we wanted her elevated. We didn't want her down with us. We wanted her above us. And even the girls dissing her at the start, oh my God, they're looking up, right? So this girl was untouchable. I made sure no guy touched her, no booty popping. I didn't want none of that. I wanted her to just be the queen of that video. She didn't have to say a word. So MTV starts playing it. Of That's course, when they, it's big. They think it's, they think it's just a butt song. And... That's, I, I said, so what? Let them think it for a while. Once, I'm not saying MTV did it for this reason, but the timing was suspect. Once I said it was about trying to fix something that had been done to African-American women, it got banned. Literally within a week of me saying that, it was, well, they don't like to say banned. It was regulated till after 9 p.m. And there's not a cuss word in the song anywhere. Think about that for a minute. I was already saying butts. I was already saying it ain't good without the mayonnaise and all this stuff on MTV. But when I finally said, this is letting people know what a sister really is, all of a sudden it got banned. And I thought my career was over. And I got a call from, from Rick's uh, 
publicist who still is publicist to this day, Heidi. And she basically in a, in a nutshell said, I thought my career was over. She said, no, 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 no. She said, and you may not know this because you're young. And I, matter of fact, I'm even too young to know this, but I, my mom told me. Elvis Presley was on Ed Sullivan one time and he shook his leg and did these gyrations, you know, gyrating his hips and people were offended, but the girls loved it. And he became the forbidden fruit. That was exactly what happened with Baby Got Back. It was the same kind of thing. Baby Got Back had no cussing in it. It was a pop song, really. And it turned into something darker, which gave it legs. Interesting. And that also probably helped the success of it in a way. Is that that unique thing? Because there are oh, yeah. several pop songs out there. That's and what I meant by gave it legs. It, it just kept moving after that. It just. And then you're up. selling out places. Um, take me through what would you say your favorite venue was? Um of all time, you know, I, you've been everywhere around the world. Um, if you had to pick a favorite venue and not just singing that song, what would you say it is? You know, once your career went off and you're touring. But I, even though I played a lot of big venues, I like the small ones. I like the see, cause I don't lip sync. So I don't have that problem where guys have to do this <laughs> up like they're rapping when they're, <laughs> I don't have to do that. Right. So when you're up close and personal and you can watch people singing along with you, they reach out, they touch your hand. Any club like that, I did a song called Till the Sun Comes Up about just those kind of venues. Um, they can't pay you much, but what they do for your career is incredible because you learn how to, you can't lip sync in front of them, right? You can't do it. They're you right read there. the crowd literally because there's right. you know a couple hundred people versus thousands and thousands at a music yeah. festival. So I really, I really fell in love with small venues every, in every city I go to. I was playing them. I do realize it was kind of costing me money because I'm playing for lesser money. So then when I go in a big venue, I try to ask for what I deserve. And they were like, no, you just played over there for that price. And so eventually I had to cut back on doing them, but I never stopped. As a matter of fact, during COVID, um, we started a, a campaign called Keep Music Live. And when a lot of the clubs were dying, you know, we were helping to keep them alive and, and saving them if we could. Yep. For sure. I remember hearing about that, especially in Tacoma. Yeah. What would you say, where do you kind of see the direction of music headed. Um, of course, I think a big thing today now, and, and of course, knowing record executives is still a very big thing. It takes 10 to 15 years. If you do make it big, maybe even longer. So many people though, you know, they upload to YouTube once. And, and this is not just, you know, in the music world and entertainment too, you know, and maybe they get one good thing and right away off the bat, everybody listens to them because it's a new thing out there. All their friends listen, they get like 5,000 views. And then the rest get like 200 views and they end up quitting, you know, um, I know because of how social media is. Hey, I have that thing with my interviews. Some get more, some get less. Luckily, yeah. I don't stop and I keep going. But where do you kind of see entertainment going because of social media in a way like that with algorithms? Yeah, let me say this. The problem with um, artists lasting nowadays, it's partially social media, but it's also the artists. They're not being artists. They're feeding the immediacy of social media as opposed to creating an image. Snoop has an image. When you see Snoop sitting there oh, talking yeah. about lime is a superfood, that's Snoop. And so they're not building images anymore. They all kind of have the same, I ain't gonna say have the same sound, but I think they think the immediacy of like TikTok, you have to cater to it. And you do to a certain extent, but if you do it, you just fizzle. They're done with you. They move on to the next thing. You have to you have to have an image, I think. For sure. That's that's a really good point, then, because you know, everyone looks for that quick success. So they might get it on TikTok. But uh, if TikTok gets banned, like in some states, you're gone. Um, and maybe no one's following you on Facebook then. So you don't have that image like you talked about where Snoop Dogg, he gets banned on Instagram tomorrow. He's a okay. He gets banned on Spotify. He's a okay. He's still going to sell at every other venue. And see, when Snoop Dogg came out, you know, which is probably a little bit after me, but that era, you had to have an image. You couldn't get in a radio station to talk on air unless you had elevated yourself above, the, you know, the riffraff. And so, guys like Snoop, guys like Ice Cube, Dr. Dre, Ice T, you know, I mean, uh, KRS One, uh, Rakim, the Goat, I think, and you know, Eminem, people like that. They have images. Same so with when, you. When yeah, when they come on, you're glued to him because you want to. What's he gonna say next? You know, and that's why every Snoop interview, I watch it. Every Ice T interview, I watch it because you learn something. 
you you learn. I, I look up to Ice T. I've been I've looked up to him forever because of his his ability to modulate the gangster with how smart he is. A lot of people don't realize Ice T is extremely smart, very sharp. So is Snoop. So is Too Short, by the way. All three for sure, are. absolutely. Yep, for sure. And what would you say? Where do you kind of see the future of, I guess, music going? Because you know we're kind of in the wave where like classical movement is kind of all over. I've interviewed Pat Boone on the show. You know that's all the past there. Um, even rap today, when I listen to like Lil Uzi Vert, it's like, uh, I'm sorry, I want to put on a uh, Ice Ice Baby, Baby Got Back, and um, <laughs> yeah, Dr. Dre, that 2001 album. There, I want to put that on the playlist instead of Lil call you Uzi. A, call you an old soul. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's constantly changing. Do you think, though, and I, and you mentioned, of course, how image is a big thing, but do you think we will ever get back to people focusing on images where they'll last for 20, 30 years? You know, because I, so. I think we will. I think we I will. hope it's so. Just, it's what, what's happening, though. You have artists that blow up so fast that a kid maybe six months younger than him looks at him and goes, that's what I got to do, because they think that that's the next. And it's. Sometimes you, you don't try to be the next anything. I, I've never tried to be anything other than when you saw the hats and me popping pimp game and songs, it's because I grew up around pimps. I'm not exaggerating. I'm not making up something. I mean, I know pimp game backwards and forwards. I know I knew the transactional aspects of pimping by the time I was 12 years old. So when I talk about it, it was real. You know, I don't, I've never claimed to be a gangster or shoot nobody, never did that. But what I do talk about is stuff that's real for me. For sure, absolutely. And I don't want to keep you for too much longer. Um, I want to but... say this too. I want to say one more thing. I, the, What scares me about the future of music is AI. Matter of fact, that scares me about the future of man. Yep. If you think about an, an, a soldier, an AI robotic soldier, if you told that soldier, I want you to protect the earth, destroy everything that could hurt the earth, guess, who that, guess what that soldier would destroy? Us. Man is the filthiest animal on the planet. That's a fact. For sure. That's you see with politicians, I've interviewed a lot of them. I've interviewed Dan Quayle, great guy, Vice President Quayle. But um, a lot of politicians are evil when it comes to going to war and stuff. So I, I think you're absolutely right on that point. And especially with AI, you saw Joe Rogan interview Steve Jobs from the dead, you know, that yeah. AI interview there. Here's so a, somebody you know, could do a fake interview of me interviewing Snoop Dogg tomorrow. So, you know, things like that. So dude, there's I, a fake, there's an Elvis Presley singing Baby Got Back. It's it's already up. Elvis Presley singing Baby Got Back. Go figure that out. And you it's know. sad because sometimes those ones that might end up getting bigger, you know, I don't, that's not going to be the case. But for some of them, you know, somebody starting that could be one. One yes, last thing I kind of want to touch on or two things real quick is. We were talking before the show, an interesting thing about you is you're a bit of a handyman. You've built what's behind you. Um, tell us a little bit about that and then what advice you'd have. I always like to close with that. Yeah, I'm 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 a big, I'm electronics nut. I mean, um, you guys can't see it. I have a, I could turn my computer around, but you know, and I got, I got an Avid S6, you know, and um, that one I needed some help wiring. I got a full um, 714. Uh, Dolby Atmos studio that I'm sitting in right now. You got speakers on the ceiling, speakers all the way around me. Um, and I'm, I'm running Focals all the way around me. I got a bunch of analog gear that I bought because the sound of music was starting to get a little thin. And I found that going through anything with transformers on it sounds thick. It gives it that thick, not old sound and just a punch to it. So I went back and brought all my analog gear back out, wired it all up. But before this, I got I was into RF electronics you know, like building old illegal ham radio amps and stuff ham like radio, that. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And I used to fix a lot of stuff. As a matter of fact, my first um, two inch tape machine was broken and it was given to me for a thousand dollars and I repaired it. it. Wasn't nothing but a power supply, something, something simple, but uh, I didn't tell them that. Interesting. Yeah. Wow. So yeah, that's always an interesting thing because everyone thinks, you know, oh, if you make it big or something, you know, everyone wants to do everything for you, you know, and, and you just mentioned, you know, you everything behind you. And for people who watch us on YouTube, uh, people also listen on Spotify, but for people who listen on YouTube, they're seeing all that behind you. That's all you, you know, that wasn't somebody who just came in and said, hey, put this behind you if you do an interview, you know, or things oh, like no, that. No, no, I only reason I do this is because if I turn the other way, all the light goes dark. For some reason, I got, I don't know why the light hits me right here. That's the only reason I do my interviews here. It has nothing to do with trying to show that everybody's got those. 
Wow. And then the last thing I kind of want to close with is what advice do you have? I think this is a big one. I guess maybe advice for an 18 year old who maybe not even just in music, but you know, they want to maybe be an actor or something, something that's a lot harder than just, you know, going to college for four years and trying to get a job at an investment bank, you know, what advice do you kind of have for them in the entertainment world? You know? Yeah. I, I would say this, um, look, look to your heroes, but don't imitate them because if you do, you'll be about maybe one sixteenth what they were. So, so don't waste your time imitating somebody you look up to, but try to figure out what it is people like about them. You know, that, that, that's part of it, man. It's like, you can, like, I used to listen to songs that blew up before I, I did. And I would study the elements of the song without stealing the song. You know, if that makes any sense, like how certain little noises came in at certain, and you watch people on the dance floor, cause I was a DJ then. And you watch people move certain ways on a dance floor, you knew, okay, I need that feel. Songs to me are living organisms. They're not, they're not, oh, listen to the bass then listen to the guitar, then listen to the drums. That's not how songs are. They breathe, you know, instruments bounce off of each other, vocals, everything. So, you know, try to be as unique as possible and don't be scared to fail. For sure. Good point. Absolutely. Hey, I get called, I, I call people up all the time. People might look at it and say, oh, you had on the vice president last month or you today, you know, really? Because there's 20 other people I reach out to and get a zero response from. So yeah, I've had on the former vice president rappers, you know, a U.S. senator, um, a yeah. bunch of country artists, but uh, there's a lot of failures too. A lot of emails that will never get opened by people. Oh, dude, let me out. tell you something. I'll tell you this right now. I, I went, I, I made my money so fast that I immediately, I rocketed it up and went broke. Then I got it again on the next song, you know, which was put them on the glass. Got it again, went broke. And I said, that's enough of this. So actually I started to really pay attention and and anything that I could find on fiscal literacy, I would study it constantly, constantly. That's a big one, I think, for people who are listening. I've had on, we got a lot of athletes at our school who are actually going D1. We had four this past year, which is pretty big for a high school in Indiana. Um, listen to that in case you're a pro player. So, or anybody who makes it big because of their um, product or mowing lawns and they make it rich right away. I think that's good financial literacy. And it's yeah. slowly being taught in schools, slowly. Yeah, it needs to be. And we're, this is America. I mean, that should be mandatory because you get a bunch we're of We're one of the richest countries in the world. So we want to yeah. know how to keep making us rich, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Hey, keep it up. Whatever, whatever man. But yeah, it's, I, I don't, um, I don't take anything for granted anymore either. Um, Cause like I said, going broke twice, you learn lessons. And now it's kind of weird because people go, you were probably making way more during baby got back. Uh -uh. I make more now by far. It's not even close. Wow. I just, I just don't talk about it, but I do, you know, and, and learn to work with other brands and stuff. You know, it's like before, if you were hip hop, you did a commercial, you got called a sellout. They don't say that now. Yes. Right. So, you know, I, I did a campaign with General Mills um, that, that got pretty big discover card um, Burger King, you know, I, I licensed my stuff out a lot. And I think it's an, there's an art to that. To give you an example, my, my second, well, third highest grossing song was a song I didn't do. It was by the Pussycat Dolls and it was called Don't Ya. And the song sampled Swass, right? <clears throat> so I didn't produce it. Um, um, what's his name? That's an old boy out of, out of Georgia. Why am I forgetting his name? Anyway, it's, uh, not CeeLo. Is it CeeLo? I don't know, it may have been CeeLo. So, but he called me on the phone and you know said something that I've done too. He said, hey man, I don't know. I just, that was on my mind. I put it in the song. And I told him then, and once again, it's all about understanding business. If I had said, I'm suing you, take my song down, that would have been the dumbest shit I could have done. What I did was I said, I don't want to I don't want to interrupt the girls' momentum. Let them keep pushing the song. You know, you and me can work it out on the sidelines. And that's exactly what we did. We never even let them know that there was a potential legal issue. Although, yeah, you ain't you ain't suing CeeLo. That's my guy. I'm not, not I'm For not sure. sure. No. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you coming on the Jacob Beer show today. Um, will you be coming to Indianapolis at, at, at all? I know you're not doing as many shows this year. Are you coming was, here this funny, year? Man, I, I kind of was almost there recently. I was, I was driving out to Michigan and I ended up going down and going around to um, Niagara Falls. 
and stuff like that. So I was in the neighborhood, but I and I got a buddy of mine in Indianapolis too, and he was pissed off. He said, "Man, you didn't come down here and see me." But hey, you know, tired of driving. I did. That was a seventy-five hundred mile round trip. Wow. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on the Jacob Beer Show today. All right, Jacob Buner Show. Gotta thank you. <laughs> Man, you do a good job too, man. Because I, I talk to people sixty years old, can't think of a question that takes them wow. fifteen minutes. They have, you know, like, like a newspaper they got to go through. You know. Well, thank so. you. Thank you for watching.